Okay, page four, fuel trim. This is a, an introduction to it. Um, we're going to be doing this again in, I believe it's section four, um, oxygen sensors, uh, theory and operation. What's the title of section four? You throw that at me real quick. Oxygen sensors and fuel trim. Oxygen sensors and fuel trim. So this won't be the, the last time you hear it. I, I, I want to try to stay away from the variables with oxygen sensors for this part. I just want to introduce this to you. I mean, we'll cover it pretty good. Uh, but there's certainly more uh, more to it when it comes to whether or not an oxygen sensor is reporting accurately or whether the sensor's bad can definitely mess up these numbers and these calculations. But for now, I think it's important that you get a good idea of whether or not a car is running rich or running lean or running normal. And I want to introduce this to you for that reason. Um, so I have some bullets up here as far as what each fuel trim does, short-term fuel trim, long-term fuel trim. And um, I think the first thing you need to understand what's going on with the trim is to get a little bit of an insight to what the oxygen sensor is doing. And uh, um, the best thing that I can do would be to uh, just draw you a picture and talk about it for a second. And uh, we'll just uh, jump over to here. And um, basically, when you're looking at an O2 sensor that's producing a signal, you're going to see um, an oscillating signal like that. Um, and there is a lot of theory that goes in behind the O2, and again, we'll do that more later. But for now, um, understand that uh, this dotted line that I drew right here, that numbers above this dotted line, which by the way is 450 millivolts, this would be a rich signal, and numbers below this would be a lean signal. And notice I use the term signal and not mixture. I'm careful in my terminology because an O2 sensor can report the wrong signal. And so if it's reporting the wrong signal, the mixture is going to be opposite. Uh, I don't want to get into that right now. We'll do that part later. Let's just uh, assume for now in these com this conversation that we have a good reporting oxygen sensor. So first thing would be is why does the signal look like that? Um, it doesn't always look like that. Uh, the sensor produces its own voltage, so this sensor, the signal you're looking at, is basically in a range of around 0 to 1 volt with a typical amplitude or min-max voltage of around 200 millivolts at the bottom and 800 millivolts at the top. Not uncommon to see 100 and 900 millivolts in that range. But that's the O2 producing the voltage, chemical reaction, uh, between the amount of oxygen in the exhaust compared to the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. So an oxygen sensor actually is sampling both areas. If there's a lot of oxygen in the exhaust, um, there's obviously a lot of oxygen outside. There's not a real big imbalance. And so the sensor produces low voltage. Another way you can remember that... Uh, Low voltage would be a lean condition is two L's, word association. Low is lean. Low voltage is a lean signal. Um, when there's very little oxygen in the exhaust, which would be a rich condition, uh, that, that sensor is going to have a bigger imbalance between the oxygen in the exhaust and the oxygen outside, and it's going to produce more voltage up to near a volt. So numbers above 450 is interpreted by the computer as rich. Numbers below 450 is interpreted by the computer as lean. Again, sensor produces its own voltage. However, the sensor signal looks like this because the computer is driving it to look like that. If you were to thread, say, a single wire Zirconia O2 into a small block Chevy, old carbureted engine uh, that our engine teacher has, Mr. Kaplan, uh, has that engine uh, on the stand. If you were to thread an O2 into that, it would produce a signal. But what would the signal look like? Um, it would be basically a flat bar of X amount of voltage, depending on how rich or lean that carburetor was. It would produce a voltage. Uh, granted, there's some other, uh, other theory in here that sensors need to be hot to work, and we'll get into more of that later, but um, it would produce a signal. So why does the signal in, in my red uh, drawing, why does it look like that? Well, it looks like that because the computer's reacting to it. Right? You've heard these terms before, possibly, and it was called open loop and closed loop. Um, in closed loop, 
Uh, and again, I have this in section four, so I'm kind of getting a little bit ahead of where we, we are right now. But in closed loop, the oxygen sensor is being used. And in open loop, it is not. You guys don't need to write that down. Again, I have that in section four. We'll do that again later. But closed loop simply means computer is going to look at the O2 and respond and react to it. So if the O2 reports a rich signal, computer sees that signal is rich and its command is going to be to take fuel away and that's going to drive it back lean so the next pass through because the computer's taking fuel away that o2 sensor is now going to drop lean computer sees a lean signal and wants to add more fuel to bring it back rich so what is causing this uh rich lean rich lean swing is the computer is making that o2 signal look like that okay so let's say that we want this vehicle operating at or near stoichiometric. Um, the computer is going to do that by switching the O2. It, it's actually called an O2 switch in some reading material. They'll call it an O2 switch. It's not really able to detect uh, how rich or how lean the mixture is on a, on a narrow band O2 like this one is. Um, it just shows where stoichiometric is. And the computer is going to move it a little bit above, a little bit below, Primary function is for catalytic converter efficiency, okay? Um, a cat needs certain gases to do its job. And on the rich side of stoichiometric, what gases are we producing? HCs, what else? CO is the main one I need. So the reduction bed, which is for NOx emissions, needs CO gas to, for that chemical reaction to pull that back apart. So a cat needs a little bit of CO uh, for that NOx reduction bed to do its job. On the uh, lean side of stoichiometric, what gas are we producing that the cat needs? Oxygen. So that cat needs oxygen to do that it's oxidizing for that oxidizing bed of HCs and CO. So we need to be moving back and forth to keep the cat happy. Um, our programs in our cars are not driven by fuel economy. They're not driven by power. What are they driven by? Primarily, when you're cruising down the road, what is the uh, engine computer primary focus? Is emissions. Okay? We can get better gas mileage. If we run a 18 to 1 air fuel ratio, uh, are we going to get better gas miles? Sure. But what's it at the sacrifice of? Emissions. Right. So, um, you know, you guys that are into programmers and tuners and yeah, you can you can put a program in a car and totally eliminate the O2 and get better gas miles. But what, what are you going to be producing more of? emissions and they're not 49 state legal. Right. They're made for track only. And what else do you have to do is remove the cat because the cat's going to melt down. Uh, you can't do it. So primary is the cat. So think about that. Computer is driven to keep this mixture where it's at. And now a little bit more with the mixture, and this can be a little bit complicated, so bear with me. Um, I want to pick uh, one set uh, of parameters for one particular engine, okay? Because understand that every engine breathes differently. Uh, depending on volumetric efficiency of that engine, every engine is going to breathe differently. Um, bore and stroke, uh, number of valves per cylinder, intake runner design, uh, to name a few. Is it, is it naturally aspirated? Is it turbocharged, supercharged? Every engine breathes differently. So let's say we have one particular engine, and what we're trying to do uh, is match the amount of air with a specific amount of fuel. So put me near stoichiometric, this 14.7 to 1 ratio. Written in the program for that vehicle is going to be how the engine breathes. So the engineer's already figured that part out. How much does this engine breathe? And we'll have this written into a program. So let's talk about some other variables as far as breathing goes. Are we going to breathe differently at sea level compared to 10,000 feet of elevation? So barometric pressure is a factor as well. Um, is it going to breathe differently with zero degrees of air temperature as opposed to 90 degrees of air temperature? Yes. So again, another parameter that we have to worry about. Um, so what I want to try to do is simplify this and say we're at sea level and we have 70 degrees of outside air and the car is at idle with the throttle closed and let's say in my hypothetical vehicle that on that particular engine that 
we're going to be operating. Let's say this is this is a uh, just kind of load, and this is engine load, and this is RPM. And there's different blocks or cells. GM used to use uh, what was called a 16-cell block learn. I don't know if you heard that term before coming out of Dan's class. But what it basically was was you had different areas of a learned memory on fuel correction. So I'm just going to put us in one block right now. Now, what I'm talking about is this idle block right here. So this load is going to match this RPM. And let's say in my hypothetical engine, again, sea level, 70 degrees outside air. We've already calculated volumetric efficiency. Uh, so we already know cam design and valve lift and all that other stuff's already been calculated. Oh, wait, not to mention fuel injector nozzle size, the fuel pressure behind it is also a factor in here too. That's all been figured out. And let's say that one millisecond shot of fuel, that means that fuel injector is going to turn on for one millisecond, is going to provide the correct amount of fuel for that air that's coming into this end. Did you follow all that? Where are we as far as fuel trim goes? We are at zero percent correct. That's where we are right now. That's ideal, that's factory, that's where we want to be. Zero percent correction means that ideal number that they wrote from the factory, all is well. Okay? From that point, now that's going to put me in stoichiometric, from that point, where do we want to go with that mixture? A little bit rich and a little bit lean from stoichiometric. What might that look like had you looked at an injector pulse and maybe graphed it on a screen is you might see 1.1 and 0.9. Would 1.1 put me up just a little bit richer than stoichiometric as far as time of the fuel injector firing? Would 0.9 put me maybe a little leaner than stoichiometric? And so what drives that injector pulse or what drives, let me, let me say this again, what drives that injection pulse which is going to drive this O2 you guys follow? It's the injector opening and closing that's driving that O2 up there is the short-term fuel trim command. That short-term fuel trim's number one job is to do what? Make sure that that O2 sensor is switching back and forth across to a convention. What will that look like? You're looking at a known good car. You see short-term fuel trim, and you're going to see positive and negative from zero in an ideal situation maybe four or five percent positive let's call it five percent ne uh, negative five percent it might not be that much maybe it's plus two and minus two in any case that short term is going to be swinging up and down that short term's command when it goes positive what's that a command to do add fuel it's that simple add fuel in the format of turn the injector on for a little bit long when it goes negative What's the command? Take fuel away, which is going to look like the injector pulse closing just a little bit. What's that going to do to the O2 signal? That right there. That top picture. O2 is going to go rich and lean in response to the short-term fuel trim. So now let's do the same thing. And let's say that we're at, I don't know, half throttle, half load. And let's say up in here, by the way, this bottom number, call that one millisecond down there but it'd be a zero percent correction right let's say up here we're at seven milliseconds i'm just hypothetical number here so we have seven times more fuel but what else do we have we have seven times more air too so we're not running rich because we have seven milliseconds of fuel now we're at idle we have one we're still at stoichiometric so What's the short-term fuel trim number up here now is uh, ideal, again, 0%. We'll call that 7 milliseconds. What's that going to look like to trim that number? It's going to go positive and negative, and it might be 7.2 and 6.8. Maybe I'm off on that number a little bit. Maybe it's 7.1 and, and 6.9. Who knows, right? It's moving back and forth again. Now, here's the thing about injection pulse, and I have people ask me all the time, what's a normal injection pulse for that vehicle? And my answer is, I don't, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, you know, think about the variables that I just spit out at you a few minutes ago about what it took to figure out what the injection pulse should be 
What if you change the altitude a little bit? Is that going to change that number? What if the air temperature changes? Is that going to change that number? And, yeah, and what if you put a different injector in that car or you change your fuel pressure? Is that all, all those numbers are going to change. So what you need to understand is every single car is going to be different. And you can't compare like a 4-liter Ford to, say, a 3.8 GM. You're thinking, well, the displacement's close, so maybe they should have the same pulse. But you don't understand they might be using different injectors. What if Ford decided to use a smaller orifice in the tip of their injectors? Isn't their on time going to be totally different than what GM is going to be? So what's a better number to look at to know if your pulse width is right? Fuel trim. Because if your fuel trim's right, your pulse width's going to be right, right? We look at the fuel trim to know how that car is performing. And so the first one is the short term. Short term is driven to keep that O2 up here. And just like, just like at idle, down here, up here, this O2 is going to be moving rich and lean. Okay? All right. So let's put a problem in this now. Let's see what happens when there's a problem. I think it helps to see a reaction to uh, a problem with a fuel trim uh, issue. Let's, let's put a vacuum leak in this first. Let's see what, what happens with the vacuum leak. And I'll just pick the idle cell here for a second. And uh, let's say that uh, O2 is happy and I pull the brake booster vacuum hose off. Of course, the O2 signal is going to go lean. We're getting a lot more air in this engine than what's being calculated. And that O2 is going to react and it's going to show the computer a lean condition. What does it immediately react and want to do? It's going to try to rich in the mixture. And what's that going to look like to us? Our short term, say, uh, over here was uh, going uh, at 0%, a little bit positive, a little bit negative from zero. But now, at this point, that short term is going to start to add fuel. And it's going to start going positive until that O2 comes up. Let's say it hit uh, plus 30%. By the way, when you're looking at uh, fuel trim on scan tool, they don't give you plus signs. They only give you minus signs. Okay, so no number in front of 30 is positive 30%. It had to add 30% more fuel before that O2 came back rich again. And now what happens is the O2 starts switching again. And the O2 is moving up and down past stoichiometric. We're protecting the cat, giving the cat what it needs. But the difference now is I'm now at 30% as a baseline. And now to correct and add fuel from 30%, it goes above 30%. And to take fuel away, it goes minus from 30%. Now, it wouldn't be a minus. It might be plus 28, but isn't plus 28 less than 30? Yeah. So would it be taking fuel away? So now my new area uh, of operation for this fuel trim is now 30%. And by the way, trouble codes usually fall in uh, about 15% is where you'll get a trouble code for a fuel trim. This is where your lean exhaust and rich exhaust trouble codes come from, right? Uh, fuel trim numbers that are beyond 15 to 20% in that range. All right, so everything's happy, but one of the things that happened with this vacuum leak is, of course, the customer's going to complain about poor gas mounts, not to mention some other idling issues if you pull the brake booster hose off, but it's a pretty big leak. Um, but definitely going to have some gas mileage issues, and you can understand why. We're adding 30% more fuel uh, than what would be normal at idle from a vacuum leak. Okay, um, if this was it, and this was all the system did, when you shut the car off and let it cool down, restart the car, and go through the process again, um, it would be lean for a long period of time until the computer, until the O2 came back to life, and the computer knows, whoa, that O2 is lean, and had to add fuel all over again. So the process would have to repeat on every shutdown. So where's the long term come into play? It's kind of in the name. Long term fuel trim is it's retained in memory. It learns where the mixture was, and what do you think the computer does on the next startup? It looks at its long-term memory and says, okay, this is where we were, so this is where we're going to start. So let's talk about how the long-term comes into play. So ideal with the long-term is going to be 0%. An ideal long-term fuel trim, of course, is 0%. You're allowed a tolerance. Plus and minus 10% is considered normal. 
Uh, I'm not going to even bat an eye at uh, a negative 5, a positive 5, a positive 7. Are you with me? A negative 7. I'm not worried about those numbers. I'm, I'm probably not going to find a cause for that. Um, there are times where you might want to look at that a little closer depending on symptom, but in this case, 0% ideal and a little bit above and below is okay. So we were good here, and now what happens? My short term is at 30%. And now if you understand the number one job of the long term, you'll understand what's going to happen next. What's my second bullet say on that page? Number one, number one job of the long term. Keep the short term. Keep the short term as close to zero percent as possible. So is my short term at zero yeah. percent? No, it's at thirty percent. So yeah, it was over here, but we're looking over here now. Is my is my short term at zero? No. no. So the long term is going to try to bring that short term back down. And what this is going to end up looking like is oh, it, it, of course it's going to matter on the car on how fast this takes place. Uh, every car is different in the reaction of the long term, but GM and Chrysler are pretty quick at changing their long term, and Ford's a little bit delayed in changing theirs. But in any case, um, what's going to happen is this is going to end up counting up. And as this one counts up, this one's going to count back down. And what's going to happen when these balance out is long term is going to be 30%, and my short term is going to be back at zero. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's kind of strange, and I have a good analogy on why this happens. Which one is responsible for keeping that O2 where it needs to be? Short term. So do you think it's important to give the short term as much correction capability as possible? Mm -hmm. um, here's another thick piece you're missing to the puzzle. Uh, fuel trim numbers are limited. They're not given ultimate control. Um, and by ultimate control, I'm saying, what would happen if an O2 signal shorted to ground on the body of the car? And that's reporting a lean condition. We said low is lean, right? What's the computer's reaction? Is to add fuel, add fuel, add fuel. What if we didn't limit it? How much fuel would that thing add? You'd have raw fuel running out of the tailpipe, wouldn't you? We have to limit these fuel trim numbers. And so if you can think about it like this, and I don't know for sure, every car is different on its limitations. Okay, but if you can think about this as your long term and this as your short term, we have limits. And I'm just gonna, since I use 30 as a number, we'll use 30 as our limit. Okay, and I'll say that my limit for short term is 30% and 30% down here. Negative 30, positive 30. And sometimes the long term is different. Sometimes it's not. For argument purposes, we'll just say that our long term limit is 30 and minus 30 as well. And we started off in the middle. That's where we want to be. We want this short term to have movement, positive and negative, to be able to do what it needs to do to that O2 sensor. When this vacuum leak occurred, it put my short term way up here. Does that short term have any more control and correction? At least in the positive range. It's out of its limit. So if I can take this and, and, and realize this car is running lean, and put this in its memory down here. Now, granted, I've buried the long term, but is that going to bring that short term back down to this midpoint? And it does. So does it now give the short term more control? And that we could actually even run leaner and I can get more fuel into this car. So one of the things you want to think about is this. There's limitations. The second thing is it's the total between the two that give you your total fuel trend. See if you guys can answer this question. I got a long term fuel trim of 30% and a short term fuel trim of 0%. Are we at our limit on either one? Can you tell me that right now? Yes, in the long term. How do you know that? So you say long term's at its limit. How do you know that? What if I've seen cars with a 50% long term? What if I did this? What if I said the long term was at 30% and the short term was at 15%? And this car hadn't been cleared and it's been dr driving for a while. Could you answer that question now? And the answer is you can. Your long term is at its limit. How do you know that? Number one job is of the long term is to do what to the short term? 
keep the short term at zero. Why isn't the short term at zero on this call? Because we're at our limit on the long term. And now this short term is probably bouncing positive and negative from 15. But is there still control for fuel for the cap for this car? Not that this is any diagnostic advantage, but you can use this information to know where your fuel trim number's maximum is. What if you saw a car that was 30% here and 30% here? You'll see them. You just got a really, really big vacuum leak or really, really bad lean condition or possibly even an O2 problem. But this would be a completely out of control system. Most likely in this case, if you were to see that, a good looking O2 would look like this. You'd be down here, 50 millivolt flat line on the O2 if you saw those kind of numbers. So just a little bit of insight on how these things react to each other. Um, let's expand on this just a little bit more. Let's watch what happens now. Everybody okay? Don't hesitate to ask a question. I'll repeat it so everybody can hear it, and, and we'll talk about it. All right, so we've, in our scenario, uh, we've compensated for it. So our short-term, I'll, I'll rewrite the numbers, our short-term fuel trim with our brake booster hose removed uh, is uh, back down at zero, and our long-term is 30. If we shut this car off, we restart the car, where does the computer look first? Yeah, if you're a kid and you burn your hand on a stove, it's your long-term memory that says, I probably shouldn't touch that again, right? It's not your short-term memory. It's your long-term memory. Pain is a good uh, motivator, right? Um, I don't know if that's a good analogy, but long-term memory says, where were we running? We were running what? Rich or lean? Easy to say rich, isn't it? I tricked you on purpose. It's a rich command. This car's running lean. <laughs> we got to get those numbers down. Everybody does that. You see 30% fuel trim. <laughs> this car's running lean. That's a rich command. In reaction to what? A lean condition. But the memory says we need to start 30% more fuel. So what's going to happen right away? As soon as you start the car, possibly even before the O2 is even warmed up and active and ready to go, the computer's already changed that fuel curve to be 30% more rich than it was previously. So our emissions improved with this long-term memory that we don't have to wait for the process to take place again. It's already there. Okay? So you start the car. What's the computer looking at first? Long-term. Okay? Now this is where a problem might happen. Especially in your interpretation, I know in particular on the ASE L1 test question, there was a question like this. And it showed a, uh, a car lean condition after the technician fixed it, that we had a short-term fuel trim command and a long-term fuel trim command. They showed them long-term was 25 and short-term was negative 25. And they asked you, what's wrong with this car? Is it running rich? Is it running lean? Is it running normal? What's the problem? This was an ASEL1 test course. The answer is the car is fixed and it's running normal. They should never contradict each other. If they're contradicting each other, the problem is either gone or somebody fixed it and didn't wipe out the memory. So here's what happens. We start the car. What's looked at first? Long term. Long term memory is saying what? What kind of command is that? Add fuel, okay? Um, in, the, in the process of uh, shutting the car off, we, we've maybe, or maybe didn't even shut the car off. If I plug the brake booster vacuum hose in that I just, that I just fixed, what happens? What's the O2 signal look like? Let's uh, get a repeat of up here. Uh, we're happy now, right? We're happy being that the O2 is happy. It took 30% more fuel to make it happy, but is the O2 happy? Is the mission, is the cat happy? Uh, is the cat being fed? Yes. What happens when I plug that vacuum leak up? What's the very next thing that happens? What's the command? LT fuel trim is 30%. That O2 is going to flatline rich now. Right? Because the memory is st it's still looking at the long term to know where the base is. Short term, is, of course, is still in play. But... What happens now? Short term's looking at this number and it's saying, whoa, O2, you're too rich now. So what's immediately, the short term was at zero. 
right? It's been corrected for. Long term's at 30. What's the short term going to immediately start to do? Take it away. That's right. It's going to start going negative. And once it hits that point, it's going to pull that O2 back down. Now it's happy. What if you took a still capture, digital photo of that moment in time? What do you think you might see? You might see the short term and long term. Short term's at negative 30 and long term is at 30. That's what you might see at that brief moment in time. Does that make sense? That's what you'll see. That was an ASE L1 test question. So remember that. When the car's running normal, the technician didn't wipe out the memory. You've probably heard of people telling you, make sure you wipe out the memory after fixing a car. Uh, that would be one reason. What memory are you wiping out? That long-term memory. Okay? Everybody okay? It gets worse. <laughs> not really. It's not really. But if you, if you were able to absorb what I just threw at you, you need to understand that my little generic cell block up here uh, of these 16 cells, this is an older one. Yes, you have a question. Um, this, uh, this block, you have to understand that every single cell or load and RPM combination, let's, let's redraw and again, older GMs use 16 cells. You think today's cars use more? Probably. I don't know how many different cells they operate for fuel trim, but let's let's put a bunch of them in there just for just for uh, hypothetical uh, theory purpose. And let's say that this is engine load and this is RPM. If the memory is wiped out, what is each cell filled with? And, and that would be, you know, if you're here or in here, that would be one. That's going to put you in that block. Or if your load is here, your RPM is here. If you're at idle, you'll probably be in this block. What do you think every block is filled with if you wipe the memory out? Zeros, right? That's our percentage of fuel trim correction. Uh, one of you guys mentioned a binary number. It would be 128. Let's put this back to Svitko's class where he talked about 256 possible positions that just was computer binary numbers. It's the same thing. Why 128? If you're talking binary, why, 128 is zero, by the way. Why 120? Why do you think they picked 128 as zero? If you looked at 255 from zero to 255, you have 250, 256 possible uh, computer language, zeros and ones, right? Binary numbers. What's right in the middle of 256? 128. Zero percent. Okay. So don't sweat those numbers. It was just older GMs that used them. We'll plug those in later in section four. Uh, but in any case, whether it be 128 across the board or zero across the board, that is what you're doing when you wipe out the memory. Right? Our car that we made the vacuum leak on, again, let's say this car was normal everywhere else. So you'd have zeros across the board on this car. Which is the one cell that had relearned a number? Idle. And it was 30%. So that means when I go back to that cell, let's say I pulled that car up out of the idle block. Where am I now? I might be in, I might now be in this block. And what's that block say for memory? Zero. So down at idle, your O2 is happy. You got a vacuum leak still real bad. And you raise your RPM just a little bit. What's, that, what's the uh, O2 do immediately? O2 immediately drops lean again. And all your fuel trim numbers change. So the last part of this is to understand that every cell has a learned long-term memory in it. Okay? So just because I relearned the idle cell and everything's back to normal, by the way, when you're long-term at 30 and short-term at negative 30, are these going to balance out? Yeah, because what's the long-term driven to do? Keep the short term at zero, and the short term's way down there. So what's the long term going to do? It's going to start taking fuel away. These are going to balance out basically when we're done at zero and zero. What if this car had been driven for a long time with a vacuum leak? Do you think it would just affect the idle cell? 
or would it affect a good portion of those bottom cells? Because that's where our engine is operating in. And that we'd have to relearn all of those cells. How do you relearn the cell? You got to drive in that cell. If you're not driving in that cell, it's not relearning that cell. Have you ever heard anybody tell you it can take 500 miles of driving to relearn a car? Yeah, because maybe you never get into that block. And if you never get into that block, you're not relearning it. Not that it's an issue. It will eventually relearn itself. I don't panic about resetting the memory on cars. In fact, for fuel trim numbers, I actually want to see the learning process. That tells me I fixed the car. If I get a car that comes in that's got... 30% fuel trim long term and I fix a vacuum leak, what's the first thing I want to see when I'm done? I want to see the short term go very negative. If I see short term go negative 25 while the long term memory was 30, did I fix this car? It'll be left with 5% on the long term. Is 5% a con a, a considered normal? Is this car going to come back with a check engine light on? No, I'm done. I'm happy. I want to see that. So do I want to wipe out the memory right away? No. So a little bit of insight on fuel trim. I mean, obviously, we're going to do a lot more with this um, later on. Uh, in this section, actually, um, I'm going to show you how to recognize what type of lean condition you have. And this last black line I drew on the screen here um, is key. What's going on down in these cells compared to up in these cells, which would be higher load, higher RPM, we can actually identify what type of lean condition that we're dealing with. Whether it be vacuum leak, low fuel pressure, dirty mass airflow, plugged injectors, we can actually change our RPM while we're watching fuel trim numbers and get a good idea of what type of vacuum leak we're dealing with when we have lean conditions. Okay, everything that I just described to you would be the flip side if the car was running rich. If you had a leaking fuel pressure regulator, whatever, and you're sucking fuel in through the vacuum hose, what do you think the reaction is going to be immediately with the short-term fuel trip? It's going to take fuel away. So what are we going to see? We're going to see negative numbers. Everything is there. It's just the opposite. Okay, last comment. Don't forget. If you see negative fuel trim numbers, that's a lean command. The car's not running lean, it's running rich. If you see positive fuel trim numbers, that's a rich command. That car is not running rich, it's running lean. One last variable, the O2 could be lying. If the O2 is lying, everything's wrong. Does that make sense? Because is everything reactive to what the O2 is doing? And if the O2 is reporting inaccurately, O2s can, can skew and they can read on the rich side all the time. What do you think the computer's going to do? It's going to take all the fuel away. It's going to max out both fuel trends. They're both going to be negative all the way. How do you think that car might run? It runs good cold because the O2 is not used. We're not in closed loop. It runs good at wide open throttle. runs horrible all the other time. Low power, won't get out of its own way. Punch it to the floor, runs beautiful. Those are the symptoms. What about the other, other end where the O2 is, is sorted and reads lean all the time? What kind of symptoms might you have from that? What's that? Yeah, way too much fuel. So under load, it might not run bad because cars under load need more fuel and rich is good. But uh, at all other times, idle and low speed and, yeah, it's horrible. Black smoke, fuel mileage is gone, right? This, what I just described to you is, is what happens when you have a bad O2, right? So... An O2 is really not needed to make a car run good. However, when you have a computer system that is set up for one, it can really mess the car up bad. Can you put a program in a car? You guys that are tuner guys love to do this on your Hondas. Eliminate your O2s and eliminate your cat. The car runs beautiful, and it does. No argument here. O2 is not needed to make a car run good. Right? But when you have a program that's designed to have one, you cannot simply remove it and just expect the car to run good. Because what's a computer driven to do? Make that O2 move. If it ain't moving, it's going to keep trying. And how's that car going to react? Not very well. Okay? little intro to fuel trim. All right, so we're going to do a fuel trim review. We talked yesterday about how it works, how it functions. And uh, the first thing you want to notice on the screen is our short-term fuel trim to the left. Um, this is our O2 to the right. 
I have the engine RPM pulled up and long term pulled up. This is on a 2008 uh, Dodge Caravan. And uh, this, this vehicle does have a little bit of a lead condition as noted by the 9% positive at idle. We already found it has a little small leak on the EGR uh, stem area. So it needs an EGR valve, but we can still review this process with this car. Um, one other thing to point out here is the voltage range on this O2 on this Chrysler. You can see it's two and a half at the base, 3.2 at the top. Um, this is a, a different subject. I actually have this in my book and it's a two and a half volt bias that Chrysler uses on their O2s, which change the signal. Um, I'm not gonna go into that right now. Just imagine two and a half as uh, your lowest lean and 3.2 as your highest rich. Somewore in the middle of this is stoichiometric, so um, it's still a basically zero to one volt O2. Ignore the numbers for this demo for now. Uh, we're gonna focus on our fuel trim. So you can see short terms moving up and down, doing exactly what we described, which is uh, altering the pulse width, which is gonna change what your O2 looks like. The reason the O2 looks like this is the computer is adding fuel, taking fuel away, and you can see that on the short term fuel trim command. The command goes rich, computer is gonna add fuel, it's gonna drive the O2 rich. When the command goes lean, the computer takes fuel away, and it's gonna drive the O2 lean. So what we wanna do first, <coughs> I'm gonna make a vacuum leak, and we're gonna watch the reaction. First thing that's gonna happen, short term is gonna start adding fuel right away, and you're gonna notice the long term is gonna follow behind it. Um, so watch the short term, watch the O2, watch the long term. I'm gonna pull the brake booster vacuum hose off. It's a really big vacuum leak, as noted by the O2 dropping lean, and immediately what you see happen, short term starting to add fuel and correct. O2 is still lean, short term still adding fuel, and what you're gonna notice is this long term is gonna start correcting, it's gonna start adding fuel because it wants this short term to be lower than what it is. We want this short term down at zero, near zero. We should see this long term correct. Some cars are a little bit funny. Oh, the car just stalled, that sucks. Okay, we'll try that again, start that back up. <laughs> we might lose our data a little bit. <laughs> Notice the short term back at zero. Why? Because we're in open loop. We just went into closed as noted by the short term increasing. I want to see this long term correct behind it. Again, long term memory. Some cars are uh, different than others in how this reacts. It might take a little bit of time. Hopefully this won't stall and it'll stay running for our demo here. Short term's maxed out at 33. Looks like that's the top number that the computer's going to allow. For short term, you notice our O2 is still lean. Still have not seen our long term correct yet. It dropped out a closed loop momentarily there, didn't it? When it short term came back down, there we go, long term's correcting now. You see how long that took? Some cars react faster. What's the long term trying to do? Number one job of the long term, keep the short, term, the short term, term at zero. It's trying to bring the short term back down, so you're gonna start to see this guy increase. Eventually, these are both gonna bury, and of course, the car stalled again. This might be just a little bit too big of a vacuum leak. Got to start it back up. Just went into closed loop. The computer's recognizing the O2 is lean, adding fuel. I want this long term to get a little bit higher before I plug this vacuum leak, because I want you to see the opposite effect.
All the terms start to count some more. And this is a leak the computer can't compensate for. It's just too big. So with short term buried at 33, long term still counting, O2 is still lean. I'm going to plug this vacuum hose up now. Let's see what it does. Hopefully not stall the car. It might. Yep. All right, as soon as I plug that vacuum leak up, what's the first thing you notice happened is the O2 went rinse. Why? Because the command was 30% here, 24% here. Notice short term's now what? Going into the negative numbers, long term starting to count back down. Short term's now moving rich and lean again. O2 is now moving rich and lean again. Couldn't really see the positive uh, fuel trim, negative long term. Sorry. You really couldn't see on this car the long term fuel trim stay positive and the short term go way negative. I missed it. I don't know if I saw it. Let's see if we can go back and take a look at that moment. It was so quick. This only got down to negative 9.2, the short term, before the long term started to correct. Well, in some cars, what you will see is, as I described yesterday, which was negative 25% on the short term, positive 25% on the long term, and that's a car that's readjusting and fixing itself. Couldn't really see that on this one, but it happened so fast, which is why we missed it. I'm gonna unfreeze this. Um, next thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to add fuel to the intake and we're going to watch this picture. Uh, first thing that's going to happen, O2 is going to go rich, short term should now go negative, long term is going to react behind that. So adding some fuel. Propane going into the intake. O2 is full rich. Again, this computer's not liking what I'm doing. See how the fuel trip short term went way negative, then jumped back up to zero. Now it's going negative again. That's the computer dropping in and out of open and closed loop. Long term coming behind. Trying to balance out the short term. O2 still rich. All right, I'm shutting the fuel off now. What's the first thing that's going to happen? Long term was at negative 33. As soon as I shut the fuel off, what's the O2 do now? Why is the O2 lean? Because the command is still negative 33%. So O2 lean, short term's now correcting, adding fuel. Watch this number. These are gonna be opposite each other now. Short term's positive, long term's negative. What's looked at first? Long term's looked at first. The command is issued. O2 reacts. Computer adjusts the O2 on the short term. These are starting to balance out. Let's see if I can pause this. Negative 22, positive 12. Getting pretty close to what I described. So again, as a review, number one job of the short term is keep the O2 moving up and down. Number one job of the long term, keep that short term as close to zero as possible. Um, hopefully I did a good job of showing that reaction. This fan's a little bit funny in how it reacts. Every car has a little bit different um, time frame that the long term will react, but a uh, pretty good example of, of those two characteristics. Short term, long term fuel trim on a 2008 Chrysler Town & Country.